Father, we just come to you, and Lord, uh, sometimes we approach you in a way that uh, is flippant and careless, and Lord, we tend to forget about just how holy you are and how we are to approach you. And one of the reminders that we get through our study here in Exodus is, is just how important it is to approach you in the manner that you've prescribed for us to approach you. Lord, we just, we just ask you to show us today as we look at Aaron and how you gave these instructions for how Aaron was to be dressed, Lord, that, that we can see through this, uh, through these instructions on how you told him to dress for glory and beauty, how, Lord, we're to be dressed in a spiritual way just as he was dressed when we approach you. And, Lord, when we do that, that's when we experience your, your presence in a, in a real and and uh, exciting way. Lord, there's so much dullness in a lot of our prayers and a, uh, a lot of the time that we spend with you, Lord, that we want to know how it is that, that we can lift up our relationship with you. And one of the ways to do that, Lord, is to come to you in a proper manner. And I just ask today that uh, through this lesson that you'll show us just how we're to dress for glory and beauty spiritually so that, Lord, we can experience the the best possible relationship we can have with you while we spend our time in this pilgrimage on this earth. Lord, once we're in glory, Lord, all, all, all of these things will pass and we'll be in your presence and we'll see your glory with our own eyes and we just look forward to that day and we know that's coming soon and all of this, Lord, we know is possible because of what Christ has done for us on the cross and his shed blood. And I just ask today, Lord, that, that we're mindful of that as as uh, we look at this text and we ask for your blessing on it, Lord, by the power of your spirit, I ask that in Christ's name, amen. You know, I always get a kick out of going to different churches and being part of different churches and seeing how people dress when they go to church. Uh, uh, I, I was a Baptist for a long time, and, and Baptist, you know, if you were a Baptist, you pretty much wore a suit when you went to church. You wore a suit and tie. The women wore dresses. Uh, you go if you're a Pentecostal, you better you better wear a suit. And the women wear dresses that are down to their ankles, and they wear buns in their hair, and 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 that's part of part of the salvation process for them. Uh, you uh, uh, there's something going on back there. Excuse me, I'm I'm being I see trying to see what's going on. Uh, I. I listened to a guy on Sunday night from uh, Pensacola Christian College, and and uh, uh, there you you watch that show on Sunday night, and they all have suits on, and all the women have dresses, and I don't think that that uh, you can get in there without a without a suit if you're a man, or without a dress if you're a woman. But but they're an evangelical church, and and uh, they preach the gospel, and and uh, they love the Lord just like we do. I, and so here at Calvary Chapel, you know, the first time I went to a Calvary Chapel, the pastor had a Hawaiian shirt on, and, and all the, the uh, people had, uh, you know, T-shirts and jeans on. And so uh, the second Calvary Chapel I went to, the, the pastor had a Hawaiian shirt on, and, he had, and all the people wore jeans and T-shirts. So, so it's funny how these churches, the, the way they dress kind of becomes sort of a uniform. Here at Calvary Chapel, we're kind of casual, and people wear jeans, and they wear they wear uh, uh, pants, women wear pants and t-shirts and those kind of things, and we dress sort of casual. I'm kinda, I kind of dress kind of in between because I can't get that Baptist out of me, that Baptist I had when I was growing up where I always wore a suit and tie when I was a little boy to church. Well, there's some good things about dressing up, and there's some bad things about dressing up for church. The good thing about dressing up for church, if you feel like Dressing up for church, you do that to honor the Lord. You want to give the Lord your very best. And I understand that's where a lot of these churches are coming from. That's a good thing. But it's a very bad thing if you're doing that in order to somehow gain merit with the Lord. Because how you dress doesn't give you any merit with the Lord. On the flip side of it, if you go to Calvary Chapel and you wear jeans and you wear a t-shirt, it's a good thing that you're exercising your freedom and that you understand that it's how you're dressed spiritually that matters and not how you dress physically. So, that, so, so that's okay. That's a good thing. But if you think somehow 
that you can come to the Lord because you dress casually and you have this liberty in Christ and you still can approach the Lord flippantly, then that's a really bad thing. And I see some of these churches where people dress and live according to the way they dress and they approach the Lord according to the way they dress. And if you approach the Lord in spiritual jeans and t-shirts, I'm telling you right now, you're approaching him the wrong way because he is a holy God, a mighty God, a creator of the creator of the universe. And when we approach him, we approach him in the way that he prescribes that we approach him. And if we approach him in any other way, then, then we're going to miss out on the kind of relationship I think that the Lord wants us to have with him. So as we come to the text today, we get a very important lesson because we, we get a lesson on, on how we're to dress spiritually when we approach the Lord because the Lord is going to give uh, Moses instructions for how the priests are to approach him uh, and how they're to minister before him. And the way, they, the, the way Aaron was to approach the Lord is the same way we're to approach the Lord spiritually. So this is a really important lesson for us, and I think we can glean a lot from this if we, if we pay attention here today. All right, now, if you remember last week, Moses, well, just before last week, we had seen that Moses had been given the law uh, by the Lord, and he had passed that law down to the people and what did the people say when Moses gave them the law all that you've said we will do and and that was their famous line of course we know they didn't do all of that but anyway they had been given the law and he had given the law to them and then Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and he leaves Joshua and he goes up and he disappears into the glory cloud and once he's in the glory cloud on top of Mount Sinai the Lord gives him the instructions for the tabernacle that's the first thing he gives him and we saw or heard those instructions last week when we studied the last chapter in Exodus. Well, today he's going to get the instructions for the priesthood. The Lord's going to give him the instructions for the priesthood. And, it's a, and it has, he has a fourfold purpose in giving him these instructions. The first purpose is to establish the Levitical priesthood. Very important part of uh, our faith is the Levitical priesthood. Uh, the second purpose is that the high priest is going to serve a type of our high priest, Jesus Christ. And so when we study Aaron, we're actually getting a shadow of Jesus Christ. But not only are we getting a shadow of Jesus Christ, the third purpose of these instructions is that we get a shadow of what we're supposed to be because we are priests and kings that minister unto God. And then... The fourth reason is that, that uh, and we'll see this today, is to teach us how we're to approach the holy and living God. And there's some great lessons in this, as I said earlier. All right, now, let's go to chapter 28, and let's pick up in verse number 1, and let's listen to these instructions that the Lord gives Moses for the priesthood. And it's going to begin with Aaron. He says in verse number 1 of chapter 28, he says, Now take Aaron your brother." Uh, what tribe was Aaron and Moses from? You ought to all know it. The tribe of Levi. And so what's going to be established here is the Levitical priesthood. And it's going to begin with Aaron and his sons. And so, so he says, take your, Aaron, your brother, and his, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel. And I want them separate from them. They're going to be totally separated from them. That he may minister to me, that Aaron may minister to me as high priest. And that Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu and Eleazar and Ithamar, may minister to me too. Now, we know a little bit about Nadab and Abihu. Their ministry is not going to last very long because they're going to approach the Lord in the wrong way. They're going to be drinking, drinking wine, and they're going to go attend to the altar, and God's going to strike them down dead. Uh, it's a good thing that God doesn't strike us down dead when we approach him in the wrong way. Uh, but, but he, he has the right to do that. He certainly had the right to do that with a native and a bayou. And then Eleazar and Ithamar, once they're dead, are going to take their place. 
And when Aaron dies, Eleazar is going to take Aaron's place. So all of those names are important, and you'll see them later on uh, when you study uh, the rest of the Pentateuch. Uh, but anyway, in verse number 2, and he said, You shall make holy garments for Aaron. I mean, he, he's going to wear garments that are unlike anybody else in the congregation. He's going he's to be dressed totally different from everybody else. Uh, you shall take holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for, and those garments are to be for glory and for beauty. In other words, Aaron is going to be the best dressed man in all of Israel because he's going to reflect my glory. He's going to reflect the glory of his new position, and he's going to reflect my glory. And he's going to be a type of Jesus Christ who is our high priest. So when we see Aaron in his dress, we're getting a shadow of none other than our high priest, Jesus Christ. And we're to be like Jesus Christ, so we get a shadow of us too. Go with me over to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. And look with me in chapter number 7. And I'm going to pick up at verse number 21 where we see this type fulfilled in Jesus Christ, this this high priest type. He says in verse number 21 of chapter 7 of Hebrews, he says, For they have become priests without an oath. In other words, Aaron and his sons and all of the Levitical priests didn't take an oath. God did not swear by them, by their performance, by what they were going to do. But he did make an oath when it relates to Jesus Christ. And here's the oath that he made. He says, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. Jesus, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, and we're not going to get into the story of Melchizedek, but he was an everlasting priest without a beginning, without an end. And and by so much more, Jesus, over Aaron and his sons and the Levitical priesthood, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant than the old covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented from... Uh, by death from continuing. Aaron's priesthood didn't last that long when you put it on the scope of history. And so the priesthood uh, of Jesus continues on and on. And he, because he continues, however, has an unchanged priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's the, the high priest that we have. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, like Aaron was set apart to be holy, he's always holy. He's harmless, he's undefiled, he's separated from sinners like Aaron was separated from the rest of the congregation of Israel, and he has become higher than the heavens. Because he's holy, uh, then his garments are holy. We're told in Psalm chapter 104 that uh, he, he... He is clothed in honor and majesty. He wraps himself in light, in the light of his glory. And so so Jesus is totally separate from the rest of the priesthood. He's totally holy. He's totally separated from mankind because of mankind's sin. But not only is Aaron a type of Jesus Christ, he's a type of you and I. You and I are part of the priesthood of believers. Look with me over to, go with me over to Romans. And look at chapter number one, and you could find the same phrase in, in or same verse basically in chapter number five. But look at chapter number one of Revelation. I said Romans. Over to Revelation. Revelation chapter one. And listen to how John describes us in verse number six. It says, And he has made us kings and priests. In verse number six, he has made us kings and priests. Unto God, his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. And so, as priests of God, we too have been separated, or we should be separated from the rest of this world. That's our problem. If you want to know the problem with the American church is, we haven't separated ourselves from this world. I tell you what. You look at most of it, there's not much difference between us and our neighbors. 
And there should be a big difference. We should be totally separate from them. The things that they do, the things they watch, the places they go, those are places we shouldn't be going. Those are things we shouldn't be watching. We should be totally different from them. And we, we're dressed in different garments. We should be dressed in the holy garments of God. We should be dressed for glory and beauty. In Isaiah chapter 61, the, the Lord says this about us. He has clothed us in a robe of righteousness. He has given us the very righteousness of God. As a bride adorns herself with jewels, that's how we should be clothed. And I, I just wonder how many people that see us see us as adorned in robes of righteousness, as adorned in holiness. That's exactly how we should be clothed, just like Aaron was clothed differently from the rest of Israel. And we should be clothed clothed differently from the rest of this world. Now, go with me back to chapter 28 of Exodus, and let's listen to these instructions. And we'll we'll see how these things are a type of what uh, this dressing of Aaron for beauty and glory is a type of the beauty and glory that we should manifest to this world. Go with me to chapter 28 and look at verse number 3, beginning in verse number 3. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans. Who gifted them? God gifted them. These artisans that are going to make these garments were chosen by God before the very foundation of the world to make these garments. They were gifted by God to make these garments. And then as they grew up, God gave them the wisdom to make uh, these garments, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, so that they can make these these garments for the high priest exactly the way I want them to be made. I've filled them with my wisdom, and I've gifted them that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him. That he Now watch this, and you're gonna see, we've seen this phrase already, and we'll see it again, that he may minister to me, that, that he may minister to me as priest. And these are the garments that they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that he may minister to to me you got that that he may minister to me you know in the priesthood for Aaron's priesthood for our priesthood we have a two-fold ministry part of our ministry on one hand is that we minister to the people on behalf of God but probably the most important aspect of our ministry of our priesthood is that we minister to God on behalf of the people. I mean, is that possible for you and I to minister to God? Yes, it's possible for us to minister to God. I mean, in, we looked at that verse in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, I mean, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, if you looked over there, we are priests unto God. We are to minister unto God. Well, how do we minister to God? We minister to God through our worship. We minister to God through our giving. We minister to God through our prayer. We minister to God through our service. And listen very carefully. We minister to God through our obedience. That's a very important way in which we minister to God. God, Jesus said it like this. If you love me, keep my commandments. You will minister to me. I will know that you love me if you keep my commandments. And so we minister to God through all of those things. And, and, and the Bible talks about grieving the heart of the Spirit or grieving the Spirit. We also can bless the Spirit when we minister to God in those things, in our worship, in our prayer, in our giving, uh, in our serving, and in our obedience. All right, now, our problem is we put way too much emphasis on God's ministry to us than we do on our ministry to him. We need to reverse that. I mean, God has done so many wonderful things for us. We know all the wonderful things he's going to do for us. Hey, it's time we turn that thing around a little bit. We can't pay the Lord back for what he's done for us or what he's going to do for us. But we certainly can minister to the Lord. We can can make it our life 
uh, our life's goal to minister to the Lord, to serve Him, to obey Him, to give to Him, to worship Him, to pray to Him. That should be, that should be our, 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 our number one goal, to minister to the, to the Lord and Savior who, is, who, is, who has done so much for us. I love what Samuel told the people in Israel when they were about to get a king. He said, fear God and serve him with all your heart in truth, for consider what great things he has done for you. If we'll just stop and consider what great things the Lord has done for us, that should cause us in gratitude to want to minister to the Lord. All right, now we get... uh, uh, the instruction for the most important part of, clothe- of the clothing of the priest. And David's going to put a slide up here for a second and I'll see if I'm in the way or not. Just to give you a little bit of a picture of what Aaron would have looked like. I think he was a better looking guy than that guy, but, but uh, I, I, I see him as more of a man's man instead of a really old, decrepit man like that. But, but anyway, he... Uh, it, you, you see on, on his head is his turban or his mitre. Uh, you see the vest, which is, is the ephod. And on that vest is the breastplate with the stones of the 12 tribes of Israel. You see the blue robe. You see the white at the bottom. If you look at the tassel on the bottom of his blue robe, that is gold pomegranates and gold bells. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But that gives you a, sort of a little bit of picture of what the high priest looks like, and the first thing that we're going to look at is the ephod. The ephod is the, the material there that's uh, the vest that comes over his shoulders that holds the breastplate that's of the many colors there. So that's the first piece that we'll look at. So go with me to uh, verse number 5, and let's look at the ephod. It said, they shall make these art- artisans, these gifted artisans and skilled artisans, uh, wise artisans, they shall... Take the gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet thread, and the fine linen, and they shall make the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, artistically woven, skillfully woven. And, And it shall have two shoulder straps joined at its two edges, and so it shall be joined together. So, so this ephod that you see up here is, is like a vest, and uh, it's worn over the heart of the high priest. That vest goes over his shoulders and over his heart. And, and the colors are very significant there. We've already talked about these colors because we saw them in the tabernacle. But the gold represents divinity. The blue represents heaven. The purple represents royalty. So it represents the king of kings and lord of lords. The scarlet, always, which is red, always represents the blood, the blood of the sacrifice. And, and so, as a priest of God, you had this vest over you, and so uh, he always had these divine things over his heart. He had this blood over his heart. He had this royalty over his heart. He had the divinity over his heart. Now, I don't know that Aaron thought of these things, but that's what he's supposed to do. That's what you're supposed to do if you're a priest of God. And by the way, you and I, if you're a born-again believer, we're priests unto God. We're priests of God to the people, and we're priests who minister to God. And so we're always to have the blue and the gold, the divinity, and heaven on our hearts. That's why Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, he says, set your mind. I mean, set your mind. This is what your mind should be set on today. Not just in this hour we're here in church. Your mind should be set on this from the time you get up to the time you get, go to bed. Set your mind on, and hearts on things above, not on the things of this earth. When you get up in the morning, that vest should come over your heart. And you should be thinking of the blood that Christ shed for you. You should be thinking of his royalty that he's sitting on his throne. You should be thinking of heaven and you should be thinking of divinity. That should be the greatest thing on your heart. And, and, and the, you know, I, I've heard the old saying, and I'm sure you've heard it too, that, 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 that Christians are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. 
That's, that's, that, there's no such thing as being too heavenly minded. And in fact, the opposite is true. The more heavenly minded we are as believers, the better priests we are and the more we can do, not the less we can do. And, and on the priest's heart was this, 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 this purple uh, fabric which represented the royalty of the king of kings who shed his scarlet blood for us. And Paul says this, that should always be over our heart. That's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind always be in you. Always you should be thinking of this, that Jesus Christ shed his blood for you. That the reason that, that you're righteous isn't because of your own effort. The reason that you've been righteous is that God has made you righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul says, let this mind always be on you, that Jesus being in the form of God made himself of no reputation and became obedient to the point of death even to the death of the cross for you. He did that for you. That should, always, that should always be on our minds. That should always be on our hearts. And if you truly keep that truth at the forefront of your heart and you wear that gold and that blue and that purple and that scarlet on your heart, uh, then you're going to be able to to minister to others. If you're not, hey, you have, we have no ministry in and of ourselves. Our ministry comes through the grace of Jesus Christ. It comes from, that, from heaven, from the divine throne of the King of Kings who shed his scarlet blood for us. Now, the ephod was a two-piece garment. And I don't know if you can tell there. I don't think you can. But there was a, the, you, you see the front there, and then there was another piece just like it on the back. Now, you don't have the breastplate on the back, but you had another piece so there was two pieces of, of garment that made this vest. And it was held together by two stones. They were held, it was held together by two onyx stones, which, were, which looked like diamonds. And on these stones, the, the six, on one stone was engraved six names of six of the tribes, and on the other stone on the other shoulder was the, engraved six names of the six other tribes. Now, now, think about that. He's got these two stones that, that button the ephod together, and there are those stones on his shoulder. What is that all about? The six stones of one tribe and the six stones of another tribe. What's that picturing? It's a picture of the priest who bears the tribes on his shoulders, just like Jesus Christ bore Israel on his shoulders, just like Jesus Christ, our high priest, bore you and I on his shoulders. And listen, as a priest, we're to bear one another on our shoulders. Isn't that exactly what Paul says over in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2? He says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You want to fulfill the law of Christ? It's not keeping the Ten Commandments. Fulfilling the law of Christ is bearing one another's burdens. I love that old song from the 70s. He ain't heavy, he's my brother. They got the, the title for that song from a book written in 1875 called The Parables of Jesus Christ. And in that book, there's a story of a little girl in a poor part of town, a five-year-old little girl who's got her little two-year-old brother on her shoulders and somebody comes along and says little girl he's too heavy for you and she says he ain't heavy he's my brother you know when you start seeing your fellow Christian brother and sister the way you're supposed to see them it's easy to bear their burdens it's easy to help them because he ain't heavy or she ain't heavy he's my brother or she's my sister and that's the way we, sh we should be that's the way we should be dressed we should be dressed with one another on our mind and on our hearts, ready to bear one another's burdens. Now, I've got to tell you again, you want to look at one of the big problems with the American church today? We live for ourselves. We hide away in our own homes, and we live for ourselves. We don't think twice about bearing somebody else's burden. And, hey, that's, that's, that cost us. 
that cost us a lot. Because as we're going to see later on, all of this is part of the dress God wants us to be dressed in if we're going to live in a close relationship to Him. And if we don't do those things, if we don't have other people on our heart, if we don't have Him on our heart, if all we've got is this world on our heart, we're not going to live in a close relationship with Jesus Christ. All right, now, on the front of the ephod, ephod, however you want to say it, however you want to pronounce it, was a breastplate. You can see the breastplate there. And on that breastplate, it's about nine inches square, and on that breastplate are four rows of stones, uh, uh, four rows, uh, I think it's four, yeah, three wide, four deep, four rows of Four rows going down of stones, three coming across. What do those stones represent? Each stone represented a tribe of Israel. Now, so we don't have any problem figuring that out. Go, go to verse number 29 of chapter 28. We'll jump ahead there. So Aaron shall bear the names of his sons, of the sons of Israel, on the breastplate of judgment. Where does he bear it? Over his heart. When he goes into the holy place, as a memorial before the Lord continually. Now, we see this phrase over and over again, as a memorial to the Lord continually, forever. You could translate it that way, as a memorial to the Lord forever. So, so whenever we see that, the principle that's, that's being given to us here in that instruction is an everlasting principle. In other words, just like we're to bear one another on our shoulders, we're to have each other on our hearts. And... and, and and always we're to have others on our hearts. And look at Jesus as our high priest. I mean, as Aaron, his job was always to have Israel on his heart. What about the Lord as a high priest? You think maybe he has, always has Israel on his heart? You better believe he does. Don't, you know, everybody's worried about Israel now. Donald Trump's not going to be able to protect Israel. Don't worry about Israel. Donald Trump doesn't protect Israel. God protects Israel. And if something happens to Israel... God, it's just God uh, working on them through a furnace to get them ready for his coming. That's, that's, that's the only way anything's going to happen to Israel. So don't worry too much about Israel because they're always on his mind and they're always on his heart. And, and we're always on his mind. Let me tell you what, every single person in this room is always on the heart of Jesus Christ. You're always on his mind and you're always on his heart. Uh, let me illustrate how much through what David says in Psalm chapter 139. He says, how precious are your thoughts to me, O Lord. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more than the number than the sand of the sea. That's how much the Lord thinks about you. More than the number of the sand of the sea. Now you go grab your handful of sand and try to count the little pebbles in it one time and you'll see when, how, how, how many thoughts that, you'll see that that's innumerable. That it's an infinite amount of thoughts that he has just toward you. Now, now we, we have an, a finite mind. So that's almost impossible for us, that is impossible for us to grasp. This idea that that, that Christ has this mind of infinity and he's capable of thinking of all the people all the time. He knows our thoughts before we think our thoughts, every person on this earth, and especially the household of God. He knows your thoughts. He, 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 he sees your future. He knows your future. He knew you when he died on the cross. You've always been on his mind and always been on his heart. Now, we don't have those kind of minds. We're far from having that kind of mind. Our mind is a finite mind, and it's limited. And so as priests of God, we can't do what Jesus does. I can't be thinking of you guys, everybody in this room, all the time, every minute, every second of the day. I can't do that. I mean, I think of my wife that much, but, and my grandkids, and my, and my kids, and, and I think of you guys, believe me, and I pray for you. But I have a finite mind. And not, very, not too fine, I don't, I don't smile when I say that. But I want to just think a minute about the Apostle Paul. I mean, he was a wise guy. I, I mean, he, he had a brilliant mind, but it was a finite mind. But you remember how he opened every one of his letters 
When he opened his letters, let, let me give you some examples. Ephesians chapter 1. He says, I give thanks for you and make mention of you always in my prayers. Listen to him in Romans chapter 1. For God is my witness who I serve with my spirit of the gospel of his son. In other words, what I'm going to say to you is not hyperbole. God is my witness that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. I mean, you could go to every letter, and Paul says something similar to that, which meant that Paul prayed for every church that he planted and every member in that church without ceasing, always. That's why Paul says pray without ceasing. He wouldn't talk about pray for your own needs and pray for yourself and pray, you know, pray for blessing from God without ceasing. That's what he was talking about. He was talking about praying for one another without ceasing, never stop. Never stop putting other people on your mind. That is a good habit to develop. I mean, I want you to go through the rest of this day and, 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 and try that. Instead of thinking about yourself, spend the whole day without ceasing thinking about others and see where that will get you. Uh, it will probably give you a headache, but uh, try that. We're so self-centered. You know, people that come up to me, and I've used this illustration before, so bear with me, but I have people who come up to me all the time and say, well, I can't pray like that because, because I have a hard time with names. Well, the reason you have a hard time with names is because you don't take the time to care for anybody else. I promise you this. If you pray for somebody, you will never forget their name. You will know them because you make an effort to pray for them. They'll become part of your heart and you will remember their name. That's not an excuse. We need to be praying for uh, one another, and we need to pray continually. The, uh, there's another reason that the names of the tribes were in these stones and, and uh, on over the heart of the high priest. And the reason was that when Aaron went in to minister, when he went in to make the sacrifices, especially on the Day of Atonement, he was to have not himself only on his mind. He was to have the people of Israel on his mind. And, and, and they were to be near to his heart when he ministered in the tabernacle. And again, especially on the Day of Atonement when, they, when the, the sins of Israel were uh, atoned for uh, through the sprinkled blood uh, in the holiest of holies. What a great picture that is of the heart of Jesus Christ. Aaron slaughtered rams to cover the sin. Jesus allowed himself to be slaughtered to cover our sins. And not to cover our sins, to pay for every single one of our sins. And when he was on that cross, he had a breastplate, a spiritual breastplate over his heart. And it had the name of every single person who had ever lived and who would ever live. They were on his heart. Now, we can't fathom that because we have finite minds, but he doesn't have a finite mind. And as God on the cross, he didn't have a finite mind. He had an infinite mind. And on his mind and heart, he knew you back then. I mean, we sometimes, we, we make light of the cross. We turn the cross into some kind of generic coverall where Jesus did this one death and he just sort of, you know, paid for all the sins of the world and, and, and got a certificate for it. And, and hey, now they're covered. That's not the way it happened. Every sin that has ever been committed all the way back to Adam by every single person was laid on him, and he was punished for that sin on that cross. Every single sin. And you and I were on his heart when he was dying on that cross. I love the parable, one of my favorite parables in the Bible. It's one of the shortest parables, if it's not the shortest parable in the Bible. It's the pearl of great price. Over in Matthew chapter 13, you remember the, the, the parable, the merchant is seeking beautiful pearls. And when he had found one pearl of great price, 
went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. You know, I could tell a lot about somebody's theology when I see how they interpret that parable. When I used to buy commentaries to, uh, early on in my, when, I was, when, I, when I was younger and I was buying these commentaries, the first thing I would do when I looked at the commentary, I would go and see how they interpreted Matthew chapter uh, 13, verses 45 through 47. That little short parable told me everything about them. And it'll tell me a lot about you on how you interpret it. A lot of people, I'd say the majority of expositors, say that the merchant is us. And we go out and we seek Christ. And when we found him, we give everything we have and we buy him. Now there's a lot of wrong with that theology. How many of you have given everything you have to buy Jesus Christ? If you raise your hand, yes, see me after church, and I want to be sure you sell the rest of it so we can put it in the offering box back there. Because there ain't any of us that's given everything we've had to Jesus Christ. I've not yet to know the man that's given everything he has to Jesus Christ. Moody says, I've yet to, D.L. Moody, the greatest evangelist who's ever lived, baby. He said, I've yet to see the man who's given everything to Jesus Christ. What God could do with a man or woman like that. No, the merchant is Jesus Christ. And he comes to this earth. He's been seeking since the days of Adam those who will be the children of God. And when he finds us, even if it's one of us, and he sees it as one pearl, he sees you as one pearl. When he finds us, he goes out and he gives all he has to buy us. He gave everything he had. He emptied himself of his glory, his throne and glory, and he came down to buy us. And you know what? When we get to heaven, you know what the gates of heaven are made of? Anybody know? Pearls. You and I, we're the gates of heaven. We're the, the, made of pearls of great price. It might be some actual pearls there with your name on it and my name on it. But uh, if there's no pearls... Hey, you're part of the gate is what you're part of. And spiritually you are anyway. Then in verse number 30, he gives one other thing that we find on the breastplate, and it's a bag for the Urim and the Thummim. Look at verse number 30. He says, and you shall put in the breastplate of judgment. Now, I don't know exactly. There, there's all sorts of theories. Some say it was just a little bag that, hung from the breastplate. Some say there was a little compartment that opened up and they were inside the breastplate. But it, that really doesn't matter. But, but anyway, he says, you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart. Again, it's over his heart. This is something, a, a picture of what we're to do. A picture of what Christ does. This is over our heart. When he goes in before the Lord so Aaron can bear and really judgment's the wrong word. Bear the wisdom. Bear, give wisdom to the children of Israel from his heart before the Lord continually. In other words, one of the priest's job, if you study, if you went through our study in Kings and First uh, Chronicles and Second Chronicles with Brandon, you remember over and over again, who did they seek? Now, they didn't always do that, but the good kings, who did they seek? when they wanted to hear from God about a particular situation, they went to the high priest. And no doubt he had the Urim and the Thummim. And so, so let's talk a little bit about the Urim and the Thummim. Thummim means perfection. That's what the word means. Urim means lights. And all of that makes perfect sense because these stones were used to light the way for the people of Israel so that they walked in the perfect will of God. So you've got perfection and you've got light. Now what was actually the Urim and Thummim? I think they both were stones. Now there's, there's a couple of main traditions about the Urim and Thummim. One said that they, the, the, one stone, the, the stones were the same and that one, that if it lit up, one lit up, it was the, 
uh, the answer was yes. If the other one lit up, the answer was no. There was one for yes and one for no. Almost kind of like a, I hate to say it, but kind of like a Ouija board, you know. It's kind of, uh, I mean, it was kind of magical the way it worked. But it wasn't demons doing it, it was God doing it. When the priest was really seeking God, God would give them a, the, an answer to their question through the Urim and the Thummim. Uh, uh, no doubt, more, uh, more than likely, let me say, put it this way, they were two stones. And I, I think the second tradition is probably more accurate, uh, that the priest would pull out the stone. One was a black stone. Uh, the Urim was a white stone. And they would ask a series of yes and no questions. And so if you pull out, if you ask, let's say the priest, the king came to the priest and said, should we go to war? The priest would go to the Urim and Thummim and he would, he would pray about it. Then he would dig into the bag. And if he pulled out a, a white stone, the answer was yes, you should go to war. If he pulled out a black stone, the answer was no, you don't go to war. Or he asked, the next question would be, uh, do we go to war today? If he pulled out a uh, a black stone, the answer would be no. If you pull out a white stone, the answer would be yes. And so he threw a series of yes and no questions. You would find the, the perfect will of God. And, and I think more than likely that's the way it worked. And if the priest was seeking God, then God spoke to him through the Urim and Thummim. But these things are shadows. These things are shadows of realities, spiritual realities. Now, I remember when I first studied the Urim and Thummim, I thought, man, I wish I had a Urim and Thummim I could wear around my neck. And every time I needed to know what to do, I'd say, God, do I, do, should I buy this truck, pull it out, and it, it's black. I'll put it back in and say, Lord, should I buy this truck and keep pulling until I get the white one? You know, and I'm teasing. But, but you would, if you could get the answer from God and you would listen to that answer, it would be really you know, really nice thing to have around. You would always be walking in the will of God. But over the years, God has taught me that I have something much better than the Urim and the Thummim. I don't have to just get a yes and no answer. I can get a specific answer from the Lord. The Urim means light. What light do we have? We have the word of God, which is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. That's exactly what the Word of God is all about. And the reason a lot of people aren't walking in the will of God is because they're not walking in the Word. You want to find the will of God, you get in the Word. And God will speak to you supernaturally through the Word. I really believe that. But we also have the perfect, the thumbing, the perfect spirit of God to guide us into all wisdom. All we have to do is ask God, we're told by James, and God will give us wisdom for any type of decision we're trying to make. And he will do that. Here's our problem. We want something quick. And that was the nice thing about the Urim and Thummim. You could get a quick answer. I don't know if that thing worked if you were really in prayer with the Lord. But, but we want a quick answer. We've got to be willing to wait on the Lord and then do what the Lord says if we're going to hear from the Lord. But the Lord will speak to us. We have our own Urim and Thummim. And again, it's much better than a bag around our neck with two, two uh, balls in it. And that, not only do we... Not only do we have the word and we have the spirit, through the spirit God gives us the gift of tongues, God gives us the gift of words of knowledge, uh, God gives us the gift of prophecies. I mean, I believe in those things. I've had prophecies that have been given to me that well, changed my direction and, and they, were, they were perfect in, what, in the direction that they gave me. So I believe in those things. I've had a lot of prophecies that, that didn't match up with the word and I just, hey, I don't, I just blow those off. And, and again, I always believe that if God wants you to do something, he will speak to you directly. So even if you get a word of prophecy, you want to wait and make sure that God's speaking that word of prophecy to you. All right, now, the next thing that we get is the robe in verses, verse number 31. He said, and you shall make a robe uh, of the ephod of all blue, again, heavenly. There's the robe, you see the blue robe there that he's wearing under the ephod. There shall be an opening for the head in the middle of it shall be, have a woven binding all around its opening like the opening of a coat of mail so that it does not tear. And upon its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet all around the hem and bales of gold between all 
the pomegranates, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate, and so on and so on and so on. And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers, uh, and its sound will be heard. He goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, that he may not die. That he may not die. Now, that's interesting. Those, that's the, the hem of the garment, and you really don't see it in this picture. It had these pomegranates, and it had these bells. What's a bell for? Christmas bells. What, what do Christmas bells do? They announce the coming of Jesus Christ. They announce a joyful experience. And when Aaron went into the tabernacle to minister on behalf of the people, he was announcing the fact that their sins had been forgiven, and those bells rang. And they rang and they rang while he was ministering in there, and people should have all had joy in what the Lord was doing for them as he ministered those sacrifices because their sins were being covered and they were going to live uh, 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 live on and not be destroyed because of their sin. So they, they should have been excited about that. Later on, those bells took on a more practical role. What happened was when the priest went in to minister into the tabernacle, if he did one thing wrong, God struck him dead. Now, Brandon went into the tabernacle, and God, and I hear the bells ringing away, and all of a sudden they stopped. I ain't going in there to get him. And none of y'all are going to go in and get him. So what they used to do, they tied a rope around the ankle of the priest, and he would go in there, and if the bells stopped for a while, they would just drag him on out. Now, that would be, a, we'd be Brandon, that'd be tough to get you out of there, but we'd get you out of there. <laughs> so they served their purpose. What about the pomegranates? You know, I always wondered about the pomegranates, and you can look in all sorts of commentaries, and you really don't get an answer. And then I was in Israel a few years back, and at every corner just about, they had a pomegranate stand. And it hit me. Pomegranate is the national fruit of Israel. I mean, everybody has pomegranates. And what else hit me, when you look at that pomegranate, I never thought about it before. What is a pomegranate made of? It's made of seeds. It's all about seeds. As priests unto God, what should we be all about? Planting seeds, seeds that have this membrane covering the sweet juice, this, this sweetness. We should be planting those seeds always. It should be prolific planting of those seeds. And I have no doubt that's, that's why uh, these seeds were... were uh, or that's what the pomegranate meant, and why, that's why the pomegranate was on the robe of, of Aaron. All right, now, let's see if there's anything else we need to cover here in this section before. Oh, yeah, we, have, we, we still have the miter, the hat. All right, let's, I'll get you, I'm trying to get you out of here. I thought we were going to get out really early today. All right, so the, so the next thing we have is the miter. It's called a turban in in the King James, but it's a miter. It says you shall, everybody see the miter up there, and you see the gold band around the miter, and he's going to talk about the gold band first. He said you shall also make a plate, a band, of pure gold. What's gold represent? Divinity. Aaron wasn't divine, but he represented divinity. And you should engrave on it, uh, and you should engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, and here's what you should engrave in big caps. Holiness to the Lord, on his head, on his mind, was written holiness to the Lord. And you shall put it uh, on a blue cord, that it, blue representing heaven, that it may be on the turban, and it shall be on the front of the turban. So it shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron may, uh, that Aaron may hear, uh, bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hallow and all their holy gifts and it shall always be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. In other words, before Aaron could do any type of gift, sacrifice, on behalf of the people, he had to be consecrated as holy. We'll see next week how he was consecrated through the blood offerings, which are very important. And he was consecrated before he could do anything for the people. He had to be consecrated. He wasn't consecrated by his good works. 
he was consecrated by the blood. And because he was consecrated by the blood, he could wear holiness above on his forehead. But that was, he was positionally consecrated by the blood. But he was also to be consecrated in his mind. He, he, his mind was to be consecrated to the Lord. Your mind and my mind should be consecrated to the Lord. Paul says this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 7. Whatever you do or think, whatever you do or think, do or think to the glory of God. Friends, it's time, all of us, get things out of our homes and our minds and our houses and our cars and everywhere we go that isn't holy unto the Lord. We are priests of God. And we want to not only be positionally holy, we've been made holy, righteous by the blood of Christ. We have white robes that we wear of righteousness. We want to be holy in our minds and, and uh, that's our reasonable service to the Lord, to present ourselves living sacrifices where we deny ourselves, we deny the unholy things of this world in order to be holy unto God. And, and then he finishes the chapter uh, with the uh, instructions for the garments of Aaron's sons, which were much like his garments. The only difference was he, they didn't wear the best, uh, and theirs were white, and they wore the turban, and theirs didn't say holiness to the Lord. On, they didn't have the band on it because they didn't partake in the Day of the Atonement, which was the big sacrifice that, that Aaron had to have that band on before he could actually make that sacrifice. So, there you got it. How we're to dress as priests of God. You know, here at Calvary, you can come dress just about any way you want. You could want to dress sharp, you can dress like me. If you don't want to dress sharp, you can dress like well, I won't point out any names. It really doesn't matter how you're dressed physically. What matters is what's in your heart. When you come to the Lord, when I come to the Lord, we need to be dressed for beauty and for glory, like Aaron was. We need to have white linen the robes of righteousness, not just the righteousness that's been given to us through Jesus Christ, but, but the practical righteousness, where we live out by the Spirit of God a righteous life. We need to have the blue and the gold of heaven and divinity on our heads and on our minds. And written across our forehead should be holiness unto the Lord. And on our shoulders and on our hearts should be a love and a burden for the people of God. And on our tassels should be bells that ring out the good news of Jesus Christ. And on our tassels should be the pomegranates that say we're planting lots of seeds for the gospel and that we're bearing fruit. And most importantly, and we're going to see this next week, on those beautiful garments, there was blood and there was oil. There was blood put on those garments and oil put on those garments. Blood representing the blood of Jesus Christ and oil representing the Spirit of God. And as we're going to see, I don't have time to go there today. I was going to go there, but I'll save it for next week. When we are dressed like that for glory and beauty, that's when we truly experience the presence of God in a supernatural, wonderful way, not just in heaven, but on this earth. I don't know about you, but it'd be a shame to spend this life this whole life, what we have left of this life, without that joy and excitement that comes 
from being and experiencing the presence of the true and living God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for what you've shown us today. Lord, we ask that, that it motivates us, Lord, by your Spirit to walk holy in this world, to be separate from this world. Lord, to bear one another's burdens, to pray for one another. Lord, to have heaven and, and, and Christ and his throne room and his kingdom on our mind more than the things of the kingdom of this world. Father, I just ask today that you make us the kind of priest that you want us to be. Lord, because we want to experience you in a real and wonderful way. Lord, we need that in this dark time. Lord, the darker things get, the more we turn to you and to your light, Lord, the brighter things get, the more wonderful things get, and the more peace and joy and love we experience. We ask for that in our lives, Lord, and that's only possible through what you've done for us on the cross, and we thank you so much for that. In Christ's name I pray, amen.